having me. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to use this <coughs> seminar as an opportunity to give a talk that I don't usually get to talk, which is a little bit more general. Um, just talking about the mission and showing some of the pretty pictures and most exciting science results from the Cassini mission. <coughs> the reason for that is the Cassini mission right now we're planning the end of the mission. So it's it's almost over and you guys are all young and I want everyone to want us to go back. Okay, so I'm going to try to convince you that this, this kind of thing, this kind of research is well worth doing. This is one of the many pretty pictures that Cassini has taken. Um, Cassini is a spacecraft, by the way. It's a uh, NASA. All of these pictures actually are credited with NASA, but it is a joint European Space Agency NASA mission. With over 5,000 uh, scientists and engineers have worked on, so it's a big mission. This is one of pretty pictures. This is Titan, my favorite moon. In the background is Saturn. This is the rings here that you can see. That's the only one of the, the other moons of Saturn. Um, just to go way, way back. Saturn is one of the planets that's easily visible with our naked eye in the sky. It's the furthest planet that we can see easily. With some minor magnification, maybe a nice pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you can see the rings of Cassini. Um, many of you guys have probably looked through, or of Saturn. Many of you guys have probably looked through a telescope and seen it. If you haven't and you get an opportunity to, I definitely recommend it. It's one of the most amazing sights to see. The first, so humans have known about Saturn for a long time, but the first two maybe scientists to really carefully observe and study Saturn are these two gentlemen, um, Giovanni Cassini, who's an Italian, and Christian Huygens, who was Dutch. And these two scientists were kind of typical scientists of their time, born into privileged, um, well-educated, interested in many topics, including physics, math, engineering, philosophy, uh, astrology, you name it. Um, this guy, Chris, uh, Giovanni Cassini, uh, is important for Saturn because he discovered four of the moons. First one to look carefully and observe four moons orbiting around Saturn. He also discovered uh, a gap, the biggest gap that we can observe in Saturn's rings. Christian Huygens discovered Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. He also did both of these guys and lots of other things, but in particular, Christian Huygens famous for inventing the pendulum clock. Just to give you some idea about um, what the observations looked like that these two men made, this is some data from Cassini. Um, Saturn orbits the Sun every 29 years, so that's quite a long year for Saturn. But because of that long orbit, when you look at Saturn over different times of its orbit, you see the rings differently. Okay, sometimes they look like they're tilted up, sometimes they look like they're tilted down, and sometimes you're looking straight on at them and they're very hard to see. Giovanni Cassini correctly interpreted um, that change in the appearance of the rings as Saturn orbiting around the Sun in a tilted ring structure. Okay, maybe not a big deal now, but you have to remember this is well before the kind of images that we have now looking through very, very primitive optics compared to what even the telescopes that you guys could easily buy at Walmart. He also was looking at the moons of Saturn, and in a particular um, moon, Iapetus, he noticed that when it was on the west side of Saturn, he could no longer see it. So it appeared, and then it disappeared, and it appeared, and it disappeared. And he correctly um, explained that by the fact that Iapetus is what we call tidally locked to Saturn. So the moon is tidally locked to the Earth, and that basically means that when we look at the moon, we're always seeing the same side of the moon. Okay, so it orbits with a period that is the same as a day on the moon. Okay, so that means that every the, the same face of the moon always points towards the Earth. Same with the moons of Saturn. So because of that, um, if you had one side of Iapetus that was really dark and one side that was really bright, if Iapetus was on one side of Saturn, Cassini correctly explained that you would have a difficult time seeing it. So if we go forward many hundreds of years, okay, uh, we can start going to the first spacecraft that are uh, visiting the Saturn system. So Cassini is actually the fourth spacecraft to uh, visit Saturn. The first was Pioneer 11, which visited Saturn in 1979. This is 
is a replica of the Pioneer spacecraft. And these are two examples of images that Pioneer sent back. Back in those days, the biggest problem uh, with planetary spacecraft was having enough bandwidth to send the data that it was receiving back to Earth. So you can see these images that it took are quite blurry. Um, but these are really the first close images that we ever got of these objects in the outer solar system. This was before Hubble, okay, where you got these really, Hubble has really nice, uh, gives really nice pictures of these objects as well. The particular Titan, this was the first close image that we ever got of Titan. And Pioneer was able to make some um, small measurements. For example, it was able to uh, observe the temperature uh, of Titan. Uh, shortly after Pioneer, uh, there's Voyager 1 and the Voyager 2 flybys in 1980 and 1981. These are some images from those two flybys. You can see the image quality is much better. This is a, a replica of the Voyager spacecraft that is at JPL, that's the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. If you guys go there, you can go and take a look at this replica. Uh, and yeah, the images that the Voyagers took were quite a bit better than Pioneer. Here's an image of Saturn. You can clearly see uh, some ring structure around Saturn, some moons, some smaller moons, and then some banded structure in the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, here's Mimas and Iapetus. Mimas here uh, is known as the Death Star Moon. <laughs> I don't understand why. Yeah. It's, known for having this very, very large crater, and we'll take more, we'll look at more images of, of Venus uh, in a bit. I have this here, now think, remember, these are the first good images we've ever gotten of these moons. Here you can see that in fact, Cassini was right, it appears there's a dark region here on Apodis, and then a lighter region here. But this is about the re resolution that uh, Voyager sent back of these moons. Um, Voyager made, Voyager 1, made a very close flyby of Titan. And just to give you an idea of how important Titan is in our solar system, um, scientists decided that after it went uh, by Saturn, Voyager 1 would make a Titan flyby, and basically that Titan flyby would put it out of the plane of the solar system. So if it flew by Titan, that was the end of it observing planets. Okay, whereas Voyager 2 went on to look at Uranus and Neptune. But they thought flying by Titan was important enough that that was worth it for them um, to send Voyager by Titan. And what Voyager discovered, right, was that Titan <coughs> 4 was this kind of blob. In fact, this orange blob is not the surface, but it is a very dense atmosphere, mostly composed of nitrogen, just like the Earth's atmosphere, um, that has very complex structure. This purple that you're seeing here, these are haze layers. And it also observed that this atmosphere is so thick with smog, kind of like the orange smog that you see above LA on a bad day, that you cannot, on the invisible wavelength, see down through this atmosphere at the surface of Titan. You can't see the surface of Titan in the visible wavelengths. Okay, but these missions uh, were just really uh, exploratory missions. So this is just a figure showing uh, the trajectory of the Pioneer spacecraft and the Voyager spacecraft. These missions, they flew by uh, the outer planets, getting really the first good images that we've ever had. They didn't, they weren't set up um, with an extended mission to make careful measurements because they really didn't even know what they were going to discover. And these missions definitely left scientists um, with more questions to ask than answers and set us up for the next set of missions, which was Galileo that go back out to the outer planets and actually orbit those planets and take careful measurements. So, the start of the Cassini mission, it actually began in 1982. There was a working group that met of uh, international scientists, and that working group proposed a Saturn orbiter and a lander for Titan. This was actually, I like this mission because it goes well with my life. That's actually the year I was born, 1982. Okay, so I was born and people decided, right, to plan this mission. Basically, scientists get together and they make a plan for a mission and they propose it formally and then it's selected. This mission did not have a hard time 
uh, getting selected. But you can see how long it takes to plan a mission. It begins in 1982, and this mission wasn't launched until 1997. It takes that long to figure out what your science objectives are, to build and test the instruments, okay, get the right launch window. This launch shown here is actually quite controversial because Cassini is going to go to out to the outer solar system where um, solar panels that you typically see on spacecraft aren't very efficient source of power because you're so far from the sun. So it is actually powered by a thermoelectric device that derives energy from the radioactive decay of plutonium. And people, when this launch, maybe some of you guys remember that are older, were very, very worried that if this launch failed, or if you look at the trajectory of Cassini, it left the Earth and made two flybys of Venus, and then it made another flyby of the Earth. Each one of these flybys gave it a boost in its orbit and allowed it to uh, get out to the outer solar system. So people were worried during this close Earth flyby that maybe something would go wrong and it would come back into the Earth's atmosphere. So people were really worried, protesting this launch, because they thought if this somehow failed, there would be plutonium scattered throughout the Earth's atmosphere, um, which obviously would be bad for lots of people. But it didn't fail. The chances of it failing were very, very small. And we've launched other spacecraft with the same kind of um, thermoelectric reactor since. So people don't worry about it too much anymore. Um, but yeah, it made its way out uh, through the solar system. Very long <coughs> cruise and arriving at Saturn in 2004. So that's the year I graduated from college. Okay. So Linda asked me why did I decide to work on this mission? It was really just the right mission at the right time for me. I started graduate school, and my advisor said, "What do you want to work on?" And I thought, "Well, I like Titan. This <coughs> Cassini mission just started, so let's work. Let's think about the project that I can work on with that." But that's so the entire time I was alive, basically, people were, the same people that I work with now on the mission were planning this mission and getting it to Saturn. Uh, the Cassini spacecraft looks like this before it launched. Okay, obviously it's in space now. But it's quite big. It's about the size of a school bus. Um, here, the big thing on the top of it, that's its high gain antenna. We do some science with that, but it also its primary um, function is to receive signals and send data back to Earth. And how, by the way, these, commun these spacecraft communicate with Earth is through something called the Deep Space Network. If you've ever seen Contact, Jodie Foster's got the headphones on, she's standing by those big um, dishes. That's one of the arrays in the Deep Space Network, they're scattered around the Earth. There are these big dishes that we can always be, no matter um, what the, the pointing is, we can always be in contact with our satellites in, in deep space. <coughs> um, let's see. Uh, along the side of Cassini are various instruments. Uh, this right here is what's called the Huygens probe, right? So Cassini is named after Giovanni Cassini. This, this um, probe here is named after Christian Huygens. And this is the probe that Cassini has released, or will release in this picture, that will descend through Titan's atmosphere and land on the surface of Titan. Okay, so now time for lots of pretty new Cassini pictures. You can see the difference. This is the first thing that Cassini flew by when it got to Saturn. This is Phoebe. It's, um, a relatively large moon, 137 miles across, but still small compared to, say, Titan. Um, this moon is quite far out. It's about four times further out than any other large moon of Saturn. Uh, and by flying by it, right, we not only got these great images of what it looked like, and we didn't have anything close to this resolution before, but we were able to measure the density of this moon. And it's about the same density as Pluto. That, along with its composition and its shape, um, led scientists to believe that this moon is actually a Kuiper Belt object. So the Kuiper Belt is this region outside of the orbit of Neptune with a whole lot of leftover space material from the formation of the solar system. So all of the planets were made out of material in this disk of debris. The Kuiper Belt has material that's left over 
from that period of planetary formation. So this object, sometimes the Kuiper Belt objects are thrown into the inner solar system. A lot of comets come from the, the Kuiper Belt. This object must have been thrown in from the Kuiper Belt and then somehow captured by Saturn's gravitational field. But yeah, instantly we know more about this moon than we could have ever discovered by just observing it from the Earth. Uh, not to waste any time, the next thing that Cassini flew by is Titan, my favorite moon. Okay, here's a great picture of Titan. Again, it's got this really dense, orange, smoggy atmosphere. And if you look at a picture of it in the visible wavelength, that's all that you see. It's a big moon, so this one was, you know, 137 miles across. This is over 3,000 miles across. And Titan is actually the second largest moon in the solar system. The only one larger is Ganymede, which is a moon of Jupiter. And just so we have an idea about what we really knew about Titan before Cassini, this is pretty much the best image that we had in terms of what's underneath that dense atmosphere. So this is an image that was actually taken from an 8 meter, which is a large telescope, um, on the surface of the Earth. And using special filters, you can actually, if you look at very specific wavelength ranges, you're able to peer through the atmosphere. So the molecules in Titan's atmosphere, they absorb and scatter light at most wavelengths, but some specific wavelengths, they'll mostly let the light through. So if you look at in those wavelengths, you can get some idea about the surface. So basically, all we knew before seeing was that some of the surface is light and some of the surface is dark, okay, from this image. But we knew, and you can see here, that's where, so we can see the Hoyans, which um, they plan to have it land here in the dark area, but kind of right next to this bright area. <coughs> There's something else we also knew, though. So we knew about now the composition from Voyager uh, and the temperature of Titan's atmosphere. Um, Titan's atmosphere is mostly made of molecular nitrogen, but it's about 5% methane. Uh, the Earth is very special, the Earth's atmosphere, because the temperature and pressure at the surface of the Earth is such that water is very close to what we call the triple point. And that's, this is a pressure versus temperature graph. That's the region where water, for example, on the Earth can be in its solid, liquid or gas phase. Small changes in our atmospheric temperature or pressure can push right through around. So you could really have water in any of these three phases. Well, it was known uh, at Titan that this same thing was true, not for water, but for methane. Okay, so at the pressure and temperature of Titan's atmosphere, scientists knew that it was possible that methane could be in a liquid, gas, or solid form. So when they looked at this image, some scientists thought that maybe these dark regions were seas of methane, seas of liquid methane. Okay, so that's part of, part of the reason why we really wanted to send a spacecraft down to the surface of Titan. So right, right away, as soon as Cassini got there, it released the Huygens probe. So it released it in late uh, 2004, it had a pretty long cruise down, and it landed on the surface in January of 2005. This is obviously, hopefully obviously, an artist's <laughs> rendition of what the surface looked like. Okay, um, And this is kind of what scientists were hoping for or imagining might, might be what would happen. See uh, methane and ethane. Huygens probe, it was designed to land in, in liquid if, if, that, if that happened. Okay. Um, very dense atmosphere again. So let's, we can kind of see what happened. I have a video, hopefully that will play here. Oh, I don't know if I can take up the volume. <coughs> let's see if this will work. <coughs> in this image, taken by the Cassini spacecraft. Saturn's atmosphere shows a banded structure and a number of storms. We view the edge of Saturn's gigantic ring system. 
the rings cast major shadows onto Saturn's southern hemisphere. Titan is surrounded by a partially transparent brown haze. Features on Titan's surface appear. The dark regions along Titan's equator are mostly dune fields. The brighter regions are highlands a few hundred meters high. Images taken from the Huygens probe show Titan's surface in more detail. The probe had spectrometers that measured small variations in the color of Titan's surface that are exaggerated here. Most of Titan's surface is brown. North of the landing site, a pair of parallel dark dunes stretch east-west along the image. A large highland of triangular shape lies to the northwest. More and more dark canyons appear in this area, a complicated network of channels where rivers of methane flowed at some time in the past. To the east of the landing site is a system of bright ridges standing out above the dark, dry lake bed. The ridges have intricate structures that tell stories about their past. The Huygens probe descended toward one of these ridges. As we approach the surface further, we can see this ridge in finer detail. Some regions were imaged with high resolution just before Huygens landed on Titan, especially the area to the west of the landing site. Most of Titan's surface is covered by dark organics that are produced in the atmosphere and slowly settle down. The bright spots may be exposed patches of water ice. The white dot in the center of the image is the landed Huygens probe. While the probe rotated during the descent, its orientation after landing had the camera looking to the south. The camera saw a field of pebbles that were carried around by a river of methane in the past. Some pebbles are larger than a human hand. The descent imager spectral radiometer is the dark green instrument at the south side of the Huygens probe. Its lamp illuminated the surface, allowing spectral analysis. The lamp's spotlight stands out brightly since days on Titan are even darker than cloudy days on Earth. Little sunlight reaches Titan's surface due to its thick haze and large distance from the sun. The right side shows the green Dizzer instrument. With the gold-colored lamp and the three camera windows to its right, the cameras that provided the first close-up view of Titan's shrouded surface. Well, that's just one. There's lots of videos that are fun. But that gives you an idea. This is the first <coughs> time we've been able to really peer through invisible wavelengths, Titan's atmosphere. So what did the Huygens probe see? It basically saw a surface that was way more like the Earth's surface than we could have possibly imagined. So this is uh, the Huygens probe set back about 350 images. It survived on the surface for about 90 minutes, so that's and that's about what it was planned or designed to do. Okay. Um, so here's one of the images it sent back as it was descending. And if you are a geologist or maybe you've had geology, this might look familiar. These are known as dendritic channels. And what causes these channels to form? on the Earth is rainfall, basically. So if you're hiking and you get higher and higher in the mountains, you'll notice that the streams right, are thinner and thinner and more numerous. As those streams travel down the mountain, they combine with other streams and make bigger and bigger channels. So you get close to the base of the mountain, then you've got real big rivers flowing, and in the valley you've got a large um, river bringing water down into some flat basin. That's what they observed at on Titan's surface, indicating that there was some sort of atmospheric <coughs> source of liquid. Uh, here is an actual image on, from the surface, from the Huygens probe, and here you can see those rock um, features that the video was talking about. All of these icy moons, they're made up of water ice that's basically as hard as silicate rock are here on the surface of the Earth. Okay, that's the rock analogy on these icy moons. So everything here is carved out of ice. These rocks are made of water ice. But the orange stuff, that's that organic material that's made in Titan's atmosphere. Um, the fact that these rocks look like they're rounded indicates that there was some sort of fluvial process that came through and eroded them and caused them to be rounded, just like you would see on a dried up riverbed uh, on Earth. Another thing that happened when Huygens landed, it's a, it was a warm spacecraft, 
relative to the surface, and its detectors detected a burst of methane as soon as it landed. You can imagine putting something warm into maybe a muddy, uh, some muddy or wet soil, you would see a burst of water into the atmosphere, the humidity would go up. The same thing happened here, indicating that Huygens landed basically in moist soil on, on the surface of Titan. So it didn't land in a sea, but it certainly landed in a region that indicated that liquid methane, methane at least had existed on the surface of Titan at some point. I like this slide because it just shows we actually really haven't landed on that many things. Humankind, right? This is Earth. <coughs> Here's Titan. Mars, right? Matt Damon landed there. <laughs> and Venus, which is an incredibly hard planet to land on. He's kind of given up on that at least for a little while. It's very acidic. The moon. Um, here's an asteroid, and of course we could add one more to this slide now because we've landed on a comet just recently. Um, so, very cool. Everyone, just a lot of people don't know about this when I ask them, but you should all be amazed and in awe that we managed to land on this distant moon um, in Saturn's system. Uh, this is just a Cassini mission overview slide that shows from year to year what Cassini is doing. And all of these little things that look like Titan are Titan flybys. Got other moons here. Saturn and its changing ring orientation. This is just, I threw this in here to show you, right? There's still lots more Titan science to do. Not only is Titan the primary uh, target of the Cassini mission because it's so interesting, uh, Titan is also massive enough that you can use it to perturb the um, trajectory of the spacecraft. So every time it wants to change its inclination or its tilt relative to the orbital plane of Saturn, it flies by Titan and does that. So it's got a lot of flybys for that reason as well. But yeah, for the rest of the mission we had to somehow observe this, right? We're back to this above the atmosphere, can't see through the surface in the visible wavelength. Um, but you can see through the surface, or you can see through the atmosphere of Titan if you have the right instrument. And that's again this idea that if you look in the right wavelength range, you can peer through the atmosphere because the atmospheric molecules are not absorbing or scattering the light. So the best region of the spectrum to look at the surface of Titan at is the radio, which is over here. It's a nice, uh, clear atmospheric window, both for our atmosphere and for the atmosphere of Titan. And by bouncing radio waves off of the surface and observing what they look like when they come back towards the spacecraft, um, you can determine things like the orientation of the surface, how rough the surface is, and what the surface is made of. What you lose by going to long radio wavelengths is resolution. Okay? If you've got a wavelength on the order of one meter, you can't resolve anything that's less than one meter uh, in size. So many, if the first time I would have given this talk, I would have only had a few swaths, but now it's been until almost over 10 years. So this uh, is what Titan's northern pole looks like. And these are radar images. There's a composite of many radar images. You can see there's a, a linear pattern to this data. Radar data comes in swaths, so it really just looks like a big strip of data. And this is a false colored image, but what you're seeing here is that there's rough areas that are colored orange, that's the surface of Titan, the dry surface, and there are these blue areas that the radar showed were incredibly smooth, okay, very, very smooth in terms of how it reflected the radio waves back. And this data, along with some other data from other instruments, completely convincing that these are, in fact, your liquid reservoirs of methane or ethane. So even though we didn't land in one, there is liquid methane and ethane, actually, they think it's a mix of uh, on Titan's surface in these very large lakes and also in lots of little lakes, okay, mostly at the poles. But this lake, Kraken Mar, is the largest one. It's about 680 miles long, so it's a big, it's a big lake, okay. Um, and we can get more images of these dendritic channels. Here you can see um, these dendritic channels flowing into uh, the lakes. And you can also observe things like scientists look at the shorelines, which show that the shorelines of these lakes uh, show evidence of changing over time, just like they would for a water lake on, on Earth. The fact 
that these, again, these dendritic channels exist indicates that there is some sort of methane rain on Titan. Uh, but Titan's atmosphere is very cold, and Titan's also a very slow rotator. So solar energy and the rotation of the Earth's atmosphere are kind of two main sources that give convective patterns and big storms on the Earth. But Titan, people that study this think that these kind of rainstorms actually happen very infrequently, at least on a big scale. But when they do happen, they're quite strong, and so infrequent rain showers is what give you this kind of erosion on the surface. And there has been evidence um, in images of rain. Here's one example of that. Um, this white speckle here, these are actually just the same image, but one has labels and one does not. These white speckles are clouds, and these two images were taken at different times here. The clouds are near some region on the surface here that looks like it's dry, it's the same color as everything else. And then the clouds move away and we have to look at that same region and now it's dark, which indicates maybe there's some kind of methane rain that moistened the surface, making it appear darker. Um, it's been quite a while now, so people are really frankly, nerding out on these lakes. They're really studying now the nitty-gritty details. Before, it's just like, oh, there's lakes. Now people are trying to understand the tides and the waves um, and really just very specific details about the lakes. And one of the cool things that people have observed <coughs> that was a big science discovery was that there is what's called the magic uh, disappearing island. And this is a this island here, which seems to appear and disappear over periods of, you know, a year, a few years. And scientists don't really know why this happens. They think it could be um, a, a region of floating ice. It could be volcanic bubbles or maybe just uh, a region of really um, big waves that are whipped up by the winds on Titan. Um, and this may not seem like this is major details, but it is interesting because certainly if it's something like a volcanic bubble, that would be very interesting for understanding the evolution atmosphere. And in general, all of this data shows that this surface is geologically active in very short time periods. So if you think about solar system surfaces, geologically they're interesting, but in our lifetime, humans existed on the Earth lifetime, they're pretty boring, they don't do much. Titan is doing a lot in even a very short lifespan, even the uh, life cycle of this one particular mission. Um, another indication that the surface of Titan is geologically young is that there are very few impact craters. Um, this is an old slide. I made this a long time ago, so I should probably double check. But when I made this slide, there was only four uh, identified craters. And other moons uh, around Saturn and Jupiter have thousands of craters. So that shows us that something is resurfacing Titan and its surface is very geologically young. Uh, let's see, other cool things about Titan's surface, it has, just like the Earth, around its equatorial region, it has dunes. So these dunes are not made of the kind of sand we have on Earth, but they're made of sand, made up of the organic material and the water ice, the rock hard water ice. By studying these dunes and comparing them to the dunes that <coughs> we observe on Earth, doing what's called comparative climatology, you can discover something about the strength and direction of the winds near the surface of Titan. Uh, and then the last thing that's cool about Titan is there's this one um, feature. This is a, an a image that was made with a composite of radar data that may or may not be a cryovolcano. There's kind of a big argument about whether it is or whether it's not. But one of the problems with Titan's atmosphere is that the methane should have has a very short lifespan and it should have disappeared a long time ago. Basically because um, <coughs> solar uh, photons disintegrate the methane and the hydrogen is lost to space and then you're just left with carbon, right? So there's this lost mechanism, mechanism of methane over time. So something has to be replenishing it and this is one potential source. Okay, so that's a lot of fun Titan stuff. We can look at some of the other moons. This is Mimas, that Death Star moon, and here you can see this is uh, an image taken by Cassini. It's a lot more clear than the one taken by Voyager. Here is that big uh, impact crater. It's 
called the Herschel Crater. It's 88 miles wide, so it's pretty much a third of the diameter of Mimas. Um, Mimas is interesting because it's one of the most heavily cratered objects in the solar system. You can see it's completely, it's about as cratered as an object can be. Okay? It's got craters on craters on craters. Um, another thing that's cool about Mimas is it actually causes that Cassini gap, so that gap in the rings that Cassini observed, that's actually at least partially caused by Mimas. And one of the things that Steiner discovered is it's not really a gap, the Cassini gap. There is material in there, but the particle size is different, so it appears dark. But there is regions where the material is almost cleared out. And the reason for that is that this um, part of the rings is in resonance, orbital resonance with Mimas. So every time particles in this part of the ring, they go around twice every time Mimas goes around once. So basically Mimas hugs on them with the same period. So if you're pushing a swing, you imagine if you always push it at the right spot, you're gonna, that swing's gonna go higher and higher. Mimas with its gravity is basically doing that to particles in this part of the ring. And what that does is it uh, causes them to change their trajectory a little bit and they scatter or collide with particles in other parts of the rings, and that clears out um, that part of the ring. And all of these, a lot of these other uh, gaps you can see are caused by the same kind of thing. All right, next moon, Iapetus. This is another cool one, right? That you can see. Notice had this very dark side and this very bright side, and in fact, that is what Cassini found. This side is almost as dark as coal extremely dark. This side is very extremely bright, okay? And the reason for this, before we had Cassini, um, people thought maybe it was due to particle bombardment. So um, there's particles in space, and these moons don't have an atmosphere, so those particles directly bombard the surface, and that could cause a darkening of the material on the surface. Other people thought maybe there was a volcanic event that covered this whole side dark material. Um, based on the Cassini data that we've collected, it's now uh, pretty strongly thought that this is something called thermal segregation. So um, at some point, right, this side uh, became a little bit darker. And because it's darker, it absorbs more sunlight and it heats up more. Because it's hotter, the sublimation rate goes up. And as volatile uh, material <coughs> sublimates off this surface, okay, so think about bright material leaving the surface because it's, it's hot, that stuff moves away from the surface on the dark side, goes over to the cold side, resettles back onto the surface. And this is kind of a um, self-fulfilling process where as it continues to happen, this side just gets darker and darker, this side just gets brighter and brighter. Um, another cool thing about Iapetus is it has kind of a crazy mountain range, this equatorial ridge. You can kind of see here, it's about uh, 10 kilometers tall, or about 6 miles. It's hard to see there, but it, it goes all the way across the equator. We don't really know what causes that mountain ridge, just people have a few theories, maybe a collapsed ring that Iapetus had, but it's kind of a cool feature of the moon. Um, <coughs> Just to give you an idea about how these kind of discoveries are made, it's always a combination of data and modeling. Okay, so this is um, data from the VIMS instrument, which is an imaging spectrometer, which is, means it's taking images of the surfaces of these planets, uh, but at, at very specific wavelengths. It's, it's taking basically images at um, here we've got one micrometer, you know, one point micrometers, 1.4, a lot, lots of data, taking an image at, at very specific filters of wavelengths, and then it's combining them. Uh, if you look at the data all together, so this is reflectance, or you can think of it as intensity versus wavelength, different molecules have very different signatures in what we call their spectrum. So if you guys are chemists, right, you could use this kind of same technique to look at different uh, materials. But this is how we figure out what these planetary surfaces are made of. We compare what their surface spectra looks like to laboratory samples. Um, if you look in the infrared, then you can determine the temperature of the surface. That's going to determine how strong it radiates in the infrared. 
And then you can feed this kind of data into a model like this one. This is a model of that thermal segregation process. And you run the model and you can see this is the model result. This is what Iapetus looks like. And it's very convincing that that is the process that's causing the light and dark size of the moon. Okay, lots more discoveries. <laughs> but talking about lots more discoveries, Cassini has actually discovered 31 of Saturn's 63 known moons. So Saturn has big moons, but also has a lot of little guys, like Atlas and Pan. You can see these little guys, they're not very spherical. Things are small. Um, they don't necessarily uh, end up being spherical in the solar system. A lot of these little moons are kind of part of the ring structure and that they're close to the rings and they perturb um, what the particles in the rings look like. So yeah, so three Cassini, 32 moons. Now we've got 63 moons and only 53 of them have names. So we got some ideas. Send them to NASA. All right. This, Enceladus, is another moon of Saturn. And before Cassini, it was interesting because of its incredible brightness and smoothness. Enceladus is pretty much as white as freshly fallen snow. It's one of the whitest objects in the solar system. And the surface, compared to the other moons of similar size, is not very cratered. Okay, there are some craters, but not too many. But we really didn't know much else about it. Um, when Cassini flew by Enceladus, this is a picture of Saturn, and these purple lines are magnetic fields. So Saturn has a global magnetic field just like the Earth, and moons like Enceladus um, perturb that magnetic field. But the perturbation of the magnetic field is stronger if the moons have some sort of atmosphere around them. So when Cassini flew by Enceladus and observed a large perturbation that was indicative of Enceladus having an atmosphere, which we knew um, couldn't be true, at least not an atmosphere like Titan has one. But what was determined was that Enceladus actually has a plumes, several plumes of gas coming out of its south pole. So this is an image of these plumes, and here, again, an image of uh, Enceladus. These plumes originate from this region here, which is known as the tiger stripe, so they kind of look like a cat just scraped the surface. And what's happening is, uh, so Enceladus has a little bit of an eccentric orbit, so as it orbits around Saturn, um, Saturn's gravitational pull on Enceladus basically um, deforms, the moon, which melts the material inside the moon and perhaps uh, widens these regions here and allows material inside the moon to escape and be expelled out into space. Um, this image also shows this kind of diffuse ring here. This is known as the E-ring. And before Cassini, we didn't know what the source of the E-ring was. But now we know the source of the E-ring is, in fact, uh, that plume of material coming out of Enceladus. So it is a major source of material in the Saturn system. Even though it's such a small moon, it has a huge impact in the Saturn system. And here you can see this image just shows that it's variable. It's stronger when it's on this side of Saturn and weaker when it's on this side. One of the reasons why the plume is interesting is because, um, well now, the recent data has shown that Enceladus has a global liquid ocean underneath its ice shell. So the reason why we know that is scientists carefully looked at features on the surface of Enceladus and they noticed over time that they have a bit of a wobble. They okay, wobble back and forth. And you can explain this wobble due to, again, the gravitational tug of Saturn on Enceladus. But it only makes sense if the shell is detached from the more massive. So this is proof that there's a global ocean uh, underneath the ice in Enceladus. Might not be a big deal, but we are right now, we're designing a mission to go to Europa to study this exact thing. So when, one of the main objectives of scientists is to look for life in our solar system, and a primary thing, uh, ingredient for life is liquid water. We know that these moons also have organic material, certainly Titan, but the other moons also have evidence of organic material. 
you mix organic material with water, you can potentially harbor life. So when you think about going to Europa, which is another icy moon, we're designing a mission to fly around it and study it. And in the long term, we're thinking, geez, how can we get through that ice shell and actually sample the liquid water? You, uh, Enceladus is giving us a direct sample through the plumes. So that's pretty cool. Let's see. I'm running. I'm going to skip through all of the stuff that I do. That's fine. Okay. So back to Titan. I just want to talk a little bit more about it, and then I'll and then I'll stop. Um, Again, Titan's atmosphere is really cool because it's very dense. It's actually at the surface one and a half times as dense as the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, it's also interesting because its composition is mostly nitrogen like the Earth's atmosphere. And the temperature has it near that triple point of methane, which gives it a lots of interesting um, dynamics. Basically, it's got a meteorological cycle just like the Earth does with clouds <coughs> and rain. But just the orange stuff in general is interesting in Titan's atmosphere. And um, how this stuff is made is one of the primary objectives of the Cassini mission, understanding how it's made. We now understand that this stuff is initially started to be made in the very upper atmosphere due to the dissociation of the molecular nitrogen and methane by both solar photons and energetic particles coming into the atmosphere. This stuff, once the methane and nitrogen is dissociated and ionized, it goes, undergoes a series of chemical reactions, making bigger and bigger organic compounds. So here we've got really complex um, molecules being formed, lots of chains. Further down in the atmosphere, these guys combine to make kind of fractal looking particles, then they get bigger and bigger until they're nearly spherical. <coughs> And it's interesting because Titan's atmosphere is made something like 10 to the 16 tons of this organic material all by itself. Um, this organic material is interesting to scientists um, because of its potential to help us understand how life forms on the Earth. So this is a very famous ex experiment, the Miller-Urey experiment, where scientists were trying to, again, understand how could life be formed on the Earth they did that by filling a chamber with what they thought the composition of the Earth's early atmosphere might be like. They sparked it with um, an electrical spark, kind of trying to uh, simulate lightning, which could provide an energy source. And they formed, when they do that, this kind of stuff. This orange, what's called tholins, which looks a lot like Titan's atmosphere. If you mix this material with water, you can make amino acids which is basically the building blocks of life. So Titan, uh, really, even though uh, its atmosphere is not exactly like, it's certainly not like the Earth's today, and it's not exactly like the early Earth's atmosphere, it is a natural laboratory for understanding how this kind of chemistry may have happened in the Earth's atmosphere before life formed. Um, if it did happen, and there is some geological evidence that these kinds of haze layers that you see in Titan did form in, in the early Earth's atmosphere, all of that organic material would have been raining down into liquid water rather than onto the surface of Titan. And you have what potentially is forming what is called the primordial soup, right? This very organic, rich, um, great for imagining how the origin of life. We don't know how it happened, but maybe this is the best mix of material you can imagine for the origin of life to come, come out of. So there's this idea that understanding Titan's atmosphere could help us understand how life originated on the Earth. Okay. And I was going to talk about my research, which is kind of boring because it's particle and fields, but I'm going to skip it. If you guys want to listen to my research, I'll talk to you. Come to a physics seminar. because It's all about not At least pretty pictures that I make. They're not actual pictures. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of picture that I make. Um, but let's go to the end. Okay. So like I said in the beginning, part of me wanting to just go through the Cassini's mission is that it's ending. So right now, scientists are pretty much finished, but scientists and engineers are meeting to plan what is called the proximal orbit of Cassini. Cassini's, most of the instruments are working fine, but the fuel that it needs to
to change its trajectory as it's running out. Okay, so even though it's had, it's had a bunch of extensions on its mission, it's time for the mission to end. So in September 2015, uh, Cassini is going to plunge into the atmosphere of Saturn. Before it does this, it's going to take these, uh, make these proximal orbits, which are going to take it through the ring plane and through the atmosphere. These are incredibly dangerous orbits for Cassini because there's lots of material in here that it could run into and damage the spacecraft. Um, its instruments are going to be on as it plunges into the atmosphere of Saturn. It's going to get the first uh, in situ or a direct sample of Saturn's atmosphere, hopefully send that data back successfully. Um, and that's going to be the end of the mission. The reason why we do this is because of something called planetary protection. So all of these missions have to uh, have an end where we know that the spacecraft is not going to crash into a moon or planet that may be habitable. So Cassini is not a really sterilized spacecraft like something we might send to Mars. So we have to plunge it into Saturn so we know it's not going to run into uh, Enceladus or Back. Okay, so I'll end it there. I didn't really talk about my research, but if you're interested, I can talk about that anytime. But I basically, I just wanted you guys to be impressed with Cassini. And if anyone asks you if we should go back, you should say yes. <laughs>